Okay, well, let's dive right into it. So we will load collision onto a blank track here. I've got a couple of MIDI parts set up that I'm gonna be using for this course. My bass track is currently empty. So we can find collision over here in the browser under instruments. I actually had the presets open there, but you can see collision. If you're sorted alphabetically, should be the second instrument that shows up there. If it's not sorted alphabetically, well, just look for collision. We're gonna drag and drop it onto the bass track here and just kind of hear what it sounds like. It's pretty quiet right off the bat. And I, I think that's intentional because this thing can get pretty loud. It actually has a built-in limiter to prevent it from going over and distorting too hard. Um, but anyway, what I wanna do for this, uh, this video right now is just give you the basic overview of the instrument. Just kind of look at all the main sections, how the signal flows through it, and also just talk best practices for this thing. One thing that I'm probably going to be doing first and foremost is opening my preferences and going to my audio tab and increasing my buffer size. I'm actually gonna increase it all the way up to 2048 samples. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that collision is fairly CPU intensive. As I mentioned in the intro video, the, um, the instrument is basically doing a whole bunch of math to simulate or an acoustic sound, a real world sound. So um, with all of this math, there's a lot of processing and hence it puts a lot of strain on your CPU. So when you're running a lot of instances in this thing, it can um, eat up the CPU percentage, which you can find up here. It could eat that up pretty easily. The other thing too, is that if you're playing a lot of notes on this, if you're playing big dense chords, it, uh, it tends to eat into the CPU quite heavily as well. So um, a quick word of warning is that sometimes collision, every once in a while, the math gets a little too complex and it like blows up and it'll freeze on a note or something like that. And unfortunately, it doesn't have a panic mode button like some other plugins do. So if it comes to it, you may just have to like literally delete the instrument from the track and reload it. So this is why I would advise when you're using collision, get in the habit of saving your project just every couple of minutes just so you don't lose progress. Any changes you make on Collision will save inside the Ableton project because it is a native Ableton Live device. So keep that in mind. So we've increased the buffer size. So there's gonna be just a little bit of latency when I hit a note. That's okay for now. I'm just gonna to have to deal with that. You may have to do the same on your computer. And if you're experimenting with Collision and you notice it starts blowing up and freezing on a note or some, something like that, which could happen, hopefully it doesn't, fingers crossed. But if it does, you're not really doing anything wrong. It's just that um, maybe your buffer size is too low and Collision's really eating into the CPU. So anyway, let's take a look at the overview before I get too carried away on computer technical stuff. So the way this is laid out is in two main sections. We have on the left-hand section here what's called the excitator. And then on the right hand side, we have what's called the resonator. And these two things are what make up the sound engine of collision. So the excitator is actually divided into two subcategories. We have the mallet and we have the noise. And these are two different ways that we can get this object over here, which is called the resonator. We can get that thing to start vibrating, hence making noise. So if you've ever been to a wedding, and you've taken the fork and you've hit the wine glass, you can think of it as the fork is your excitator, the wine glass is your resonator. The wine glass is the thing that's gonna start vibrating and create the, the tone that we hear. Now there will be some sound we hear when the fork hits the wine glass. So the mallet has a bunch of controls over here that allow us to shape that sound. We're gonna go into detail in these in the next video. But we have a mallet section and then we also have this noise which seems a little odd. What this is doing is it's actually using a noise oscillator like you'd see maybe on a subtractive synthesizer. And we can use both of these in conjunction with each other to cause the resonator to start vibrating, or we can just use one or the other by toggling them on and off. And you might think, okay, noise, that seems a little odd. If I'm trying to recreate a realistic sound, how is a noise oscillator gonna help me with that? And that's something that I thought when I first started using Collision. But uh, there's some interesting applications with this because it has a built-in filter as well as an ADSR envelope, a more traditional kind of volume envelope, which we can use to kind of shape the volume over time or cause the volume to change over time. So there's some interesting applications of this that we'll use when we get into the sound design with this. But I just want you to know it's there for right now. I'm gonna keep the mallet on. Let's take a look over here at the other half, which is the resonator. And we actually have two resonators. We can toggle between them using these two different tabs. I will say in most situations, one resonator is probably enough, 
especially when you're first getting started with this, it's okay to just stick with one thing. Just really understand what it's doing, how it's sounding before you add in a second resonator. Otherwise, it's very easy to get overwhelmed. Um, so the resonator, as I mentioned, this is the thing that's going to start vibrating, the thing that's going to start resonating, hence the name, and give us the main tone of the sound. So if we click this drop down menu, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different resonators that we can choose from. Each one is going to sound a little bit different. I'm just going to turn the volume up over here for now, just so we can hear that a little more clearly. And if I just strike a couple of notes with each of these, you'll hear that just doing that changes the sound quite a bit and I'll go through all of these and what they mean in an upcoming video but just so you can kind of hear the gist of what this thing sounds like pipe and tube finally some lower octaves higher octaves Okay, so that's the resonator section. And as you can see, we can choose the object and then depending on the object that we choose, we get a bunch of different controls that open up to us. And all of these controls in the resonator section, even the controls over here in the mallet section under the excitator, in the noise section under the excitator, these are all changing how, basically changing the harmonic output. You can really think of it like that. It's changing the harmonic output of what collision is doing. And the way that I like to think about physical modeling synthesis is not so much that I'm opening up Collision today and I'm going to make a sound. You almost want to think about it like you're making an instrument. So if I choose the string, for example, I can determine things like what is the material it's made out of? How long is the string going to vibrate for before it dampens itself? What's it going to be tuned to? Where is the string going to be plucked from? The mallet, what is it made out of? How hard is it hitting the object? So all these little decisions you have to make to kind of create an instrument, almost like an instrument maker in their workshop. If you're making a, an acoustic guitar, for example, you got to determine what type of wood you're using, the thickness of the wood, what types of, of strings you're going to be using on the guitar, what are the pickups going to be like? So all these little decisions go into creating that instrument. That's kind of what happens here with physical modeling synthesis. So as I mentioned, we'll go deep into the excitator and the resonator in the next couple of videos, but I want to just detour over here real quick where we have this global section, this sort of thin strip of controls over here. We have the volume, which I just messed with a minute ago. We have this structure control, which basically allows us to route the two resonators. If we are using two resonators, we can route them in series mode or in parallel mode. So one into two means that resonator one is gonna sound first and then that's gonna cause resonator two to start vibrating, creating sort of this like hybrid tone. And then one plus two means that the excitator object is gonna cause both resonators to start vibrating in parallel with each other, creating sort of a parallel signal with two different sounds resonating together. Finally, we have polyphony down here. This is where we can choose how many voices we can sound on our keyboard. It defaults to four, as you can see. And like I said, it is fairly CPU intensive. So they wanna keep the voice count down so you don't have too many overlapping voices causing your CPU to start spiking. And then lastly, we have these two little tabs over here, LFO and MIDI. The LFOs can be used to modulate a variety of different parameters that we can choose from the destinations here, much like you'd see in a standard subtractive synthesizer. We'll get into some of those when we do some sound design. In this uh, MIDI performance control section, this is where we can use parameters from our MIDI controller, things like the pitch bend or the mod wheel, or even aftertouch if your MIDI controller supports it. We can use those to modulate various destinations throughout the instrument. So for example, I could take my mod wheel and I could uh, modulate the noise frequency. If we go over to the excitator and turn the noise on. So the frequency of the noise could be moved around with my mod wheel if I wanted to, for example. So yeah, different MIDI parameters that we can use from our MIDI controller to modulate or change different things within the instrument itself. So that was just a real quick overview of the thing. In the next video, we'll start diving a little bit deeper, getting into um, the excitator section and what all these different controls are doing for us. Thanks everybody for watching, commenting, and indeed liking. We really do appreciate all the support we get here on our Sonic Academy YouTube channel. So if you find this video super useful, please, We'd love you to hit the subscribe button. We update the uh, YouTube channel every week with new content. And if you want to watch some more relevant content, just click on the videos beside me.